Many media pundits are dubbing the German elections a boring one. Perhaps this breaks little with tradition. After all, in 2013, Angela Merkel won her third term under the party slogan, No Experiments. Drawing attention to her experience, pragmatism and the financial stability of the country. Her victory saw her return to government in a second grand coalition with the SDP, after her previous partners, the free market-oriented Free Democrats, scored so poorly they failed to reach the 5% voting threshold to return to the Bundestag. Indeed, what seems notable about the 2013 elections is the market rush to the centre. The Greens, the Left, the Free Democrats all lost votes as the two big tent parties of the centre-right and centre-left cleaned house. This all happened despite a slightly increased turnout of around 1%. This is in contrast to the prior elections of 2009, in which all three minor parties increased their vote share. Notably here, the Free Democrats obtained a historic 14.6%, while the SDP lost 11 percentage points, giving Merkel's party a significant lead. That said, in 2009, as in 2013, and probably in 2017 too, things were, and will be, largely business as usual. Well, with one exception. Despite promising no experiments, Merkel's term from 2013 to present hasn't been free from turbulence. Allowing 1.5 million migrants unfettered into the country hardly signals continuity, and sent political shockwaves through the country that we shall get to later. Not only that, but significant changes throughout Europe and the world seem to pose significant challenges. The annexation of Crimea and an increasingly self-assured Russia, the Syrian civil war, the rise of ISIS and a growing domestic terror threat, the Brexit vote, the election of Donald Trump and the populist wave, the continuing economic crisis in the Eurozone. One would have thought that the national outrage after domestic incidents such as the Cologne mass sexual assaults, the later revelation that the police tried to cover it up, and ever more terrorist attacks would have turned masses away from Merkel. But it seems that political changes abroad, plus cushy economic circumstances at home, are turning many Germans back into her arms. At present, the CDU seems set to win by around 15 percentage points, followed by the SDP. There is one party though, trailing behind in third place, polling around 11%, that breaks the mould. In 2012, Bernd Lucke founded the Electoral Alternative 2013. The party was originally designed to be critical of the Euro and the German bailout of Euro states in crisis, and by 2013 became named Alternative for Germany, and competed in the 2013 federal elections. I've already stated that the 2013 elections marked an increased monopoly of the two centre parties and the decline of the smaller parties. However, the alternative for Germany was the one exception to this rule. They managed to gain 4.7% of the vote, narrowly missing the threshold for entering the Bundestag at 5%. This was little compared to what was to come. As the migrant crisis hit Europe and came to the fore of German consciousness, the alternative for Germany underwent a shift rightwards, eventually culminating in the ousting of Bernd Lucke by Frau Petri in 2015. Under Petri's lead, the party became a genuine threat to the establishment throughout state elections, benefiting from the constant campaigning that these elections allow for. Adopting a populist radical right platform, the party hammered Angela Merkel's party into third place in her home state of Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania in 2016, and coming first in Saxony-Anhalt, resulting in the CDU, the SDP, and the Greens forming a coalition to keep the AFD out. As of today, the party is represented in 13 of 16 states. In any case, their success hasn't precluded intra-party problems. The party has suffered and continues to suffer from an identity crisis of sort, trying to reconcile the original vision of Bernd Lucke with a more radical right-wing vision that Petri came to represent. Even Petri herself has come into conflict with the more ideologically driven elements within the party and her more pragmatic approach to campaigning. Conflicts over whether to openly align with Pegida, or whether to chastise prominent member Bjorn Hocker for his comments on Berlin's Holocaust Memorial as a monument of shame, or who to align with in the European Parliament, illustrate this plainly. 
Indeed, apart from the last question, the more rightward-leaning elements of the party have held sway over Petri's best wishes. Bjorn Hocker is still head of the party's Thuringia branch, and May of 2017 saw the party's first public demonstration with Pegida. Perhaps Petri had a point. About this time, public support for the AFD dropped markedly. As for party positioning within the European Union, well, the party's two members are split. Beatrix von Storch is aligned with Nigel Farage's Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy, while Marcus Pretzel joined Machine Le Pen's Europe of Nations and Freedom group, after being expelled from David Cameron's European Conservatives and Reformists group. Looking at this divide from the prospect of an up-and-coming election, this could have three different effects. One, alienate centrist voters put off by the radical politics of some members. Two, alienate the party base by not seeming ideologically pure enough. And three, alienate the general public by portraying themselves as politically incompetent due to party disunity and infighting. Let's deal with each of these points in more detail. The majority of voters in Germany are centrist, not wishing to rock the political boat too much. One survey found 80% of German respondents described themselves as of the political centre, 14% above the European average. It's easy to see the rise of the AFD in the same context as the FPOA in Austria. After all, only a border separates them. That said, the monopoly of the centre in German politics has been much more stable than in Austria, and neither the CDU nor SDP have suffered as significant a decline as the Austrian equivalents, the OVP and the SPOA respectively. This indicates a lesser willingness among the German population to support renegade parties, especially so with the AFD. One poll found that 75% of voters believed the party had not distanced itself enough from extremism, and that 40% of the AFD's membership believed the same. In this sense, the radical right wing of the party represents a problem electorally. It must, however, be remembered that it was the party grassroots that threw Lucca from leadership in 2015, led in part by the controversial Bjorn Hocker. And it was the party grassroots again in 2017 who resisted Petri's calls for moderation and pragmatism. Throwing away tactical alliances with groups like Pegida could demotivate the core activist base of the party but also blur the lines on key policy points, making the party less able to demarcate itself from the more hardline segments of Merkel's CDU or the more conservative Bavarian CSU. Especially so considering one study found that 46% of AFD members were formerly members of the CDU. Also, it should be underscored that the party's most successful period was immediately after Petri took the reins and steered the party in a rightward direction. In the cultural climate of the migrant crisis, this certainly resonated with voters. The issue is, now the crisis has superficially, anyway, subsided. Is a further rightward drift appropriate then? The danger is the AFD becoming another NPD, the National Democrats, a far more right-oriented outfit with strong ties to neo-Nazism. Since the alternative for Deutschland surge, the party has all but been destroyed electorally, and almost 20% of AFD members have prior political associations with either the NPD or allegedly similar groups. The NPD suffered hugely from state infiltration and numerous attempts to ban the party. Currently, the AFD isn't in a situation anywhere near as dire as this, but recently Germany's Justice Minister has declared parts of the party's manifesto a violation of the country's constitution. Times of open disunity within the AFD have occurred at times of ideological change for the party. In 2015, this was the collapse of Luca's ordo-liberalism aspirations and the rise of Petri's national conservatism. Throughout 2017, this has been the decline of Petri's hegemony and the increasingly muscular radical right contingent. Both have resulted in, or happened in congruence with, electoral decline. Perhaps there is no causal link though, just prior to Petri's ascendance, the party experienced a steady downfall from 10% in 2014 to barely 3% only one year later. Maybe this was due to party infighting or perhaps to the dwindling airtime the Eurozone crisis was receiving in the media. The same can be said of 2017 as the migrant crisis took more of a back seat. Still, decreasing party unity and increased infighting affects campaigning and distorts the party's message to voters. 
However, maybe it's not all bad for the party. Populist parties have done well to exhibit catch-all policies in order to appeal to as broad a base as possible. This is kind of what we have seen with the AFD's choice of election frontrunners, Alexander Gorland and Alice Vidal. When taken together, these candidates can, broadly speaking, be said to embody both aspects of the alternative, thus positioning the party as diversified but unified in tandem. Vidal is a metropolitan lesbian mother, fluent in Mandarin and a self-professed libertarian, that's been with the group since the electoral alternative of 2012. Gorland, on the other hand, is a former CDU member, but much more hardline, and can be seen as in the camp of Bjorn Hocker. The party is casting its net wide, which could pay dividends. Recently, both candidates have been beset by scandal. Vidal is alleged to have written an email in 2013 dubbing the government pigs, blaming Nazi guilt for immigration and declaring Germany to be overrun by Arabs. Vidal and the AFD are distancing themselves from the email and rejecting its authenticity. Regardless of whether it is authentic or not, I have no idea, it does problematise an AFD candidate said to be of the moderate wing of the party. Alexander Gorland is himself under investigation for inciting hatred after stating Germany's integration minister should be dumped back to Turkey. I should point out that this was in response to the remark by the integration minister that Germany had no culture but for her language. Both of these instances are somewhat reminiscent of Gert Wilders' prosecution in the Netherlands. Wilders was convicted of hate speech months prior to the election for promising fewer Moroccans. Wilders was charged, but no punishment was given, as the judge deemed the negative publicity punishment enough. Rather than hurting Wilders, in the short term he actually received a spike in support. This is not to say that the same thing will happen for the AFD, but it is to say that governmental and legal condemnation can go either way in the eyes of the public. In terms of potential electoral outcomes, it seems likely that the party will come in third place, but by a very wide margin to the SDP. And every other party has, in no uncertain terms apart from maybe Die Linke, has stated that they would not work with the AFD. In any case, this election is certainly not insignificant, and it will be the first time a new party has entered the Bundestag since Die Linke in the 1990s. It's certainly the first time a party of anti-immigration orientation has entered the Bundestag. The only other times a party has even come remotely close were the NPD in 1969, falling short by 1.4%, and the Republicans in 1990, falling short by 2.9%. As for practical rather than symbolic consequences, the larger the chunk of votes the AFD gets, the harder it will be for Merkel to form a coalition other than a grand coalition, a repeat of her previous term with the SDP. There is also talk of a possible Jamaica coalition, the possibility of the CDU working with both the FDP and the Greens, which would be a first in German history. One of the common features of a populist party's ascent is the perception that existing parties are merging into an indistinguishable mass making the populists the only visible alternative to business as usual. There is a chance that another German grand coalition could sediment this perception and boost the alternative in the long term. That said, Germany has had consensus-driven politics literally built into its political system since the collapse of the Third Reich, and it's done remarkably well without political conflicts and turmoil. The Germans have proven especially wary of populism, unlike their Belgian, French, Dutch, Danish, Swiss, Polish and Austrian neighbours. The staying power of the AFD will test just how much of an exception Germany really is. Thanks a lot for watching this video, if you liked the video don't forget to click like and please do subscribe, if you didn't click dislike leave a comment and tell me what you didn't like. As always massive thank you to my patrons, if it is within your means to do so please do consider becoming a supporter of the channel yourself. Thanks again guys and until next time.